have a quorum, so we won't call our meeting to order, but uh, let's convene as a subcommittee, shall we? Good. Very well then. Would you like to go ahead and call the roll just to establish that we don't have a quorum? Sure. Uh, and it is, what, 406 roughly? Uh, Mr. Brown? Yeah. Here. Uh, Mr. Cole is absent. Mr. Green? Here. Ms. Johnson? Mr. Jordan? Mr. Miller? And Mr. Ragland? Here. So that's no quorum. No quorum. All right, very well. We will then uh, convene as a subcommittee. Uh, the chairman is on his way. He's running late, so I have agreed to um, run this meeting uh, until he arrives. So uh, shall we look at our minutes? I know we can't approve them, but we can discuss any additions, deletions, or corrections if there are any. Uh, hearing none. We can come back, circle back to approve, assuming we do meet quorum today. Let's go ahead and hear the monthly financial report, Mr. Treasurer. All right. This is the monthly financial report for uh, the month of August. Total revenues for this past month came in about $8.1 million over. Uh, $7.8 million of that is due to the property tax settlement that we received in August. This is the second half collection for the calendar year, but occurs in the first half of our fiscal year. Total expenditures for the month, 9.4 million. Under plan, 6 million of that is related to personnel expenditures. And the ending cash balance year to date, therefore, is now about 25 million over plan at 418 million. Some highlights uh, for the month um, are as follows. As I said, property tax collection settlement was received this month. And that brought our year-to-date variance uh, about 2% over plan at plus $5 million. Now, there's nothing there, um, unlike some of the, the, one of the past years where we thought that first half and second half percentage settlements were going to be different because of tax code changes. Not expecting anything like that, so I'm expecting that, that uh, second, half, second half of the year, which is first half of 2020 collections, should come in as expected. I don't see any reason. Uh, there's nothing out there that tells me that they wouldn't at this point. So. Uh, that five million variance is uh, is acceptable on the dollar amount that we've received. Do you, uh, not directly related, but do you foresee any impact from the increase in conveyance fee that will begin uh, in a month? To be honest with you, I've not even thought about that. Don't know. Yeah, I off the top of my head, I'm not sure that there will be, but I. Yeah. Um, Correct answer to that is don't know. Okay. Um, <clears throat> on the state aid side, um, the um, uh, only thing I want to say about state aid, we're right spot on year to date, uh, and I'm going to address that in a in a minute. But we've spent an, a fairly inordinate amount of time talking about state aid because of how the additional monies, the 11.8 million in wellness and success, or success and wellness funding uh, is going to be paid out, how it's going to be reflected on our books. Um, and part of this is an accounting question, which impacts forecast and our monthly spending plan. The other part of it is a programmatic question. They're supposed to be spent on these types of, of programs, but you're allowed to supplant it. So a lot of people think, oh, this is all going to be all new programming. The answer to that is no, it's not. It's really going to be part of the process of identifying what are we currently doing that falls in those categories that we can report back and say we've spent the money on. It may sound a little bit odd, but we do have a team on the other side of the house, the academic side of the house, working on looking at the categories, looking at partners, and how are we going to meet the requirements for the expenditure of those funds. More than likely, all of it will be related to things that we're already doing, but understand that because of the way they're probably going to have me account for it, I'm going to put that 11.8 million, and I, I think we're going to talk about that here in a minute, a little bit further, but um, because of the way they have me account for it, if we don't 100% supplant the money and actually add new programming, those are dollars that I haven't counted for in the general fund. If it was a matter of moving 11.8 million in revenue out of the general fund over to this fund, I think it's going to be 467. 
Those three numbers. Those three numbers in some combination. If you move 11.8 million in revenue over and you point, move 11.8 million in expenditures over, then the impact on the general fund is cash balance neutral. But if you move 11.8 million in revenue and you only move 10 million in expenditures over, then I've got you know 1.8 million in expenditures remaining over here in the general fund that have gone, I'm gonna say unfunded because they moved the money. And you might create another 1.8 million of expenditures, new stuff over here. So I've, I've told the other side of the house, if you create new programs, you, you need to move something else out, to stop doing something. Uh, but we have to wait and see how that works out. So that's, that's not, it's a, it's a concern to me. Um, and again, we're going to get it in October and, and February in two payments, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. So anyway, the graphical representation of property taxes, uh, very much close on plan. State aid is spot on and nothing new in other revenues. Uh, this is just a picture of other revenues. Other financing sources, while it uh, appears graphically to be a, um, a large amount, remember that the scale over here is tens of millions of dollars instead of hundreds of millions of dollars, and that is really a residual July activity due to advances. So I snuck in a couple extra slides on you because state revenue has, is, is just bugging me every day about trying to keep track of it and understand it and get prepared for the preparation of the five-year forecast, which, by the way, I will note, um, I contacted, um, I think, all of the board, but at a minimum board leadership, and my suggestion was not to do the forecast in October. Uh, the law changed. We can wait till November. And so I wanted to wait till November for a variety of reasons. One, let's get this state aid figured out. And two, let's get our bargaining, um, collective bargaining deals done so that when I put the forecast together, I've got really good information to put in there the best I can. Doing it, I mean, I would have to have had it done today to present to you in, in the timeline of present to FAC and then present in, in September and then present to the board at the first meeting in October, adopt at the second meeting of October. If I can move that all 30 days, then I'll be back here in October, and by then I should have just more recent data. I didn't think I'd do that this year because November really was, was really waiting for, like, next year. If we put a levy on the ballot, I would want to wait till November to see if the levy passes and then factor that into the, to the five-year forecast. But nonetheless, uh, we're not talking about the forecast today, but we will next month. This, this um, <clears throat> slide, and I have several, is from a presentation by the Ohio Department of Education talking about the budget bill and how funding is set for the school district. And, and this is their sheet. looks very similar to our, uh, what we call the SFPR, School Funding Payment Report. And, um, but this is for all, all schools, okay? And this is their slide. Uh, the only thing I added was to circle that it's the June number two payment. We get two payments a month every, uh, during the fiscal year. It's from the June number two payment, and they're, and they're telling here that funding for the school district for 20 and 21 is fixed at the 19 levels. So if you look at ours, there's our June number two. And so we're fixed at this total funding of uh, $346.6 million. So we're fixed at that in this part of the calculation. Now, I will point out um, right here in this column, the calculated funding, that's the formula. And notice that they don't put a total there. They don't put a total there because it's going to be about $90 million or something bigger than 346. They don't want to remind you every time that you look at this that they're not funding you according to the formula and that we are capped. But I will do that like this sarcastically, publicly that this total here is much bigger than this total, but be that as it may, that's our, that's our limit for funding. The next slide they produced in their, their presentation was to bring forward the fixed amount, uh, that line N to this slide, and then these are the next line items that appear in this funding report. This, these next two are additional aid items, and as you notice here, it says it'll be calculated based on current year data. So that amount could change on us based upon our enrollment. Um, but then it says supplement su um, and student wellness dollars will be added. So somewhere in here, they're either going to add a line or they're going to pump the $11.8 million in there. I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but that's where it's going to show up. So you can see here that's what? Is that 165? That's $165 million versus 
almost 8.1 billion up top in that number. So this is a much smaller number. So this relationship stands the same for us, and I'll show you that in a minute. But this, is, this can vary uh, a little bit. Then these line items down here are all calculated on current year basis. So you remember me, me telling you that we don't start seeing the new enrollment numbers come through until October or so, and they start using current year data instead of last year data. Well, that's primarily gonna be reflected for us here. What's in here? Well, community schools, uh, STEM school and scholarship, that's the 190 some million that we generally refer to as community schools being deducted. So most of this is the expense side of the ledger. So this, this report, details how we get paid, how they deduct for some of the, the, uh, the expenses that we incur uh, or incurred on our behalf, and then they get down to a, to a net number. So looking at ours, you'll see that that was the 346.6 uh, uh, $346 million coming forward. You see here about 8.3 million in this other revenue, again, relatively a, a much smaller portion, and then you look here at, at our deductions for um, these, these various items. I will note here line X, other adjustments. You'll see in the footnotes in the MDNA that I think it's about a million seven. I expect that to be positive in other adjustments, so I factor that in as well. And this also doesn't include about two and a half million dollars worth of casino revenue that gets pumped into that same line item as it appears on the five-year forecast. So you may have heard during the budget discussions or seen data that says that we get 161 million, give or take, and then they added the 11.8 million and then another roughly 6 million for the next fiscal year onto those numbers. And they say, well, this is our funding. But what's odd about that is that it is a function of these expenditures. So if community schools go up or down, that 161 is going to change. Why they did it that way, I don't know. Why they, because Eric and I then just sat down and, because to look at my forecast, my forecast is revenue and it's expenditures. So the 161 and adding money to that, I had to be sure that adding 11.8 million to the net was the same as adding 11.8 million to the gross. This is a lot of inside baseball, but I just want to make sure we could get there. So we had to reverse engineer what line items they included and what line items they excluded in their calculation to say that we're getting $11.8 million. We did that. We feel we were very close and that this, whatever the funding that we get in this budget is, is close to what we had originally planned for. But that was the, the, the process we had to go through. I wanted to know, it's nice to tell me $11.8 million, but what did I plan on getting? That was important. Um, so that's, that's the number that they were working off of. And, some, and I'll tell you when we go back to what, yes. Uh, if you're going to use this for the board meeting, yeah. if you could blow it up some more. I mean, it's very difficult to read. No, that was my goal. I, I understand that. <laughs> I, I just that. wanted you to watch me wave my, you know, I'll do that. I'll see if I can get that a little bit bigger. Um, Thank you. So I did a couple of comparisons so that we, just to make me feel better that we are on target and have a handle for what the state says we're going to get, what we planned on getting, and what we are getting. So one way to look at this was to compare our June number two to our July number one to our August number two and look at some changes in the line items. And you're right, I'll blow this up. But what's a couple of very interesting things here. First of all, I inserted this first subtotal line. For this reason, if you notice, special education says generally exempted from the cap, and it did change 109,000 and 233,000. But because the cap is the cap, this went up by 109, but they adjusted all these lines up here by an identical amount because we're capped. This is just moving stuff around from an accounting perspective. So while we have to credit more for special education in terms of revenue, we will credit less in all these other categories. So this change is really no change to us from a gross funding standpoint. The only increase we got in this, in this uh, two month period was in career tech funding, about $345 in that calculation for July and $180,000 here. Very minimal changes, 
but again, I just wanted to show you that this is what drives us crazy from an accounting standpoint and why I add those two lines on the forecast. It's one, I think it's 1.03 and 1.035. I add them together into one line because the differences between the two can change just because of, of this accounting reallocation that goes on. So I add them together because I'm really only concerned about the bottom total funding number. So, you know, th this said 346, 346, 346. We're, we're right in line. So that proved to me that, that what they said, the funding is flat, is in fact flat. Um, continuing on with that, June 2, July 1, August 2, and then the difference. When we get to those uh, additional items that I said will be based upon enrollment and could change over time, they uh, so far uh, in, in July, it looked like they went down a little bit, but in June, uh, I mean, in August, it came back up about 150,000. Down here at that net number, it appears that we're getting $2.8 million more net. It's not revenue driven, it's expenditure driven. Our community school transfer number dropped. Is that a real good number? Not yet. We got to get current year data and that data is coming in every month. So we, we have, we, it's only because our expenditure has improved by $2 million based upon this preliminary estimate. So this is all the stuff that goes on back in the, in the background that we're watching every month to make sure that when I tell you we're going to get, you know, 300 and X million dollars in state revenue, that in fact that's still uh, on target. Um, another slide yet to be blown up. And what I want to do here is because the May forecast is the basis for my revenue forecast for this spending plan in this fiscal year. This is fiscal year 20 out of the May 19 forecast. This is the June number two, which is the, the flat funding and looking at the differences. And you can see I, each one of these lines is, is showing an increase um, and total funding formula up about 12.9 million. Uh, the additional items a little bit different, dropping about a half a million. Anyway, the bottom line is from a gross funding standpoint, I anticipated receiving $12.4 million more in FY20 than I did in FY19. So when the state came out and says, hey, you're getting $11.8 million more, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to say, well, I already planned to spend it. It was already in our plan. There's uh, $600,000. You know, I'm not in, 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 in this realm of millions of dollars. I'm not worried about that. So I knew I was on target with my estimate and that the 11.8 million would be good and I wouldn't have to worry that I've got to really have a huge impact on my forecast. And then I'm now worried month to month about how's the state revenue coming in. And it was troubling to me that we were on target, but the state number was $11.8 million less that they were calculating to pay me out than what I had in the plan. So I did it month by month. And what I started with was the plan that I put in each month and that plan is based upon prior year experiences for distribution of, of uh, state aid dollars. I then plugged in my actual, so far I have two months of actual, 29.7 and 30.6, essentially the same. And I assumed, well, if it stays flat, they said flat funding, shouldn't change. So if I assume 30.6 for all the other months, I then calculated the difference and I wanted to see where am I gonna start to fall behind in my month to month variances and then have that reflected in year-to-date variances because my expectation would be I ought to be about 11.8 million short in this forecast and in this monthly plan because they're going to take that 11.8 million put it in the different fund and if I don't adjust my spending plan in this report I should come up 11.8 million and lo and behold it, rather be lucky than good I guess I come up with if this holds true about 11.1 million short so all of this was about three or four different ways to look at state funding, how it's going to be paid out, what we planned on coming in not only annually but month to month, and say, in short, I mean, we know what we were doing, we know the numbers, uh, we believe this is the way it's going to get paid out, but now we've got to figure out this separate fund business and meeting the requirements for spending in these categories. So it was... 
I don't know if you feel any better, but I felt better after having done this two or three different ways and still coming up very close to that 12 million number one way or the other. Um, okay. Huh? Good. Shall we pause for a moment? Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So we are see, see currently on uh, item number three. Taking, it, taking us through it and was currently talking about the new student wellness and success funding that we've been talking about recently. So with that, um, Mr. Treasurer, does that, do we now have a quorum? One, two, three, four, yeah. We do. Okay. We, um, do you want me to proceed with this and we'll go back to approval minutes and things like that later? Sure. Okay. All right. So August expenditure, uh, financial highlights, uh, personnel is running, ran under plan about six million for the month. Uh, it now stands at, at 12 million. In fact, Mr. Treasurer, yes. I apologize. We've got a 15 minute window with one of our members. If we can go ahead and do that board approve, you know. Sure. Yeah, fine. yeah, we can approve the minutes. Approval of the minutes. Second. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That is unanimous. Got it. And do we need to approve your, uh, are we all the way through your final report? Your, your we are report? not through the financial report. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and we generally don't pass a resolution to accept gotcha. anything. It, just, it okay. just automatically is forwarded on onto the board. Thank you again for that reminder. All right, so on the personnel side, as I mentioned before, the same, same uh, explanation applies here. Um, September will be the, the month in which um, um, the recently negotiated increase for the teachers will be reflected. New positions will be reflected in September, and we'll have a, a better picture as to how that month-to-month -month cash flow uh, is going to work. Purchase services um, <clears throat> is, is running under. Um, by uh, 1.7 million for the month and now 3.1 million year to date. Um, I looked at that and it was the same um, culprits, if you will, as uh, in the past. You've got professional technical services, property services, um, electricity, um, some tuition line items that are running under that contribute to this. So those are those are ones that you know, we we budget. Uh, conservatively or adequately for, and when they run under, that's, that's, the, that's the, the good direction to be on that. Um, there was a jump in other, um, uh, other expenditure items, and that has to do with the settlement and the fact that we posted 3.2 million uh, in county auto and treasurer's fees. So if you compare expenditure, year to date expenditures from last month to this month, the big jump uh, is in county auditor and treasurer's fees. Um, just a graphical representation of, of uh, what's going on on expenditures. You see purchase services does tend to stand out. When we look at our variance analysis, I mean, just a reminder, um, my metric is five million, uh, plus or minus five million in dollar amount, plus or minus five, uh, 5% five um, as a variance that would be registered as high. On the revenue side, very much like we were at the end of the end of last year, all the variances are low except for other revenues and other financing sources, and those represent a very small percentage uh, of, of our budget uh, overall. Um, this was the first time this has ever happened. All the categories are uh, under plan at this point, so the graph looks like it's kind of upside down, but it's not. The zero line is all the way at the top. As you can see, personnel um, stands out and other uses does, but only on a uh, percentage basis because of those advances back in July. So again, variance percentages uh, could be high in some of the categories. Uh, again, the, the, those are all less than 10% individually of our overall budget. So um, all in all, um, I think we're in, we're in good shape relative to the variances year to date with only two months under our belt. I shared with you a rather lengthy uh, chart that I added this year that compares uh, original budget, revised budget, carry forward budgets, and all of that. 
Um, and one of the things I, I'm doing now is at the very far right hand of that overall chart is this portion of the, of the table. And it's comparing, um, most importantly, the far right two columns, these over here, the current revised budget to the revised budget beginning of the year. And what we're looking here is for variances that would indicate that folks are reallocating their dollars and it might help explain why our month-to-month -month variances are a little bit off. So if we see large movements of dollars from one category to the next, we might expect that those expenditures would follow and then kind of distort that picture from what we originally had planned. Uh, this is what it looked like in July. And then uh, we go forward to August and you'll see that um, it looks essentially the same. The interesting thing though is back in July, these, these change numbers uh, equated to 13.2 million. Uh, and that was simply a function of when I actually captured the revised budget data because Mr. Gooding goes in and relative to um, some carryover accounts, he makes some budget adjustments um, to based upon a, a carry forward PO that doesn't get spent for the entire amount that he carried forward for. So for instance, if somebody brings over a purchase order for $10,000 and only spends 8,000 of it, he closes that out and removes that 2,000 from their budget so that they don't get additional budget simply because they underspent last year's. He's making them stick with their original budget on a current year basis. I happened to catch it when he was in the middle of that move. So not all of the movement was completed. But when I got to this month, I caught it quicker, and that's the right number. 24,000 is the right number because uh, after we approved the appropriation resolution, the board came back and increased to 24,000. Um, and so on the ongoing basis, I'm looking for 24,000 until the board does some change. But looking at these movements in betwixt and between, um, none of those uh, give, give us pause for concern, and, and they don't. They're not explaining any of our variants. So, uh, but I just want you to know, we, I do watch that and wanted to print that out. Um, other than that, revenues are up, expenditures are, are down below plan, and we're, I think we're off to a good start. Um, and I probably, Mr. Brown, not go into all that detail about state funding, so you may not see those, those graphs uh, and charts fine. again. Um, if I decide I really want to do that uh, that meeting, I'll, I'll blow them up. They were a little hard to read, but we got the point across, I think. Sure. Thank okay. you. That's the monthly financial report for August. Thank you, Mr. Um, moving on to the economic development discussion. Okay. Um, as you all know, um, uh, the administration and ultimately the board consider uh, various tax incentive proposals that come to us from developers. Uh, developers typically start with the city, propose a project, ask for an incentive of some sort. And um, by statute, uh, the city can do certain things without our approval, but um, if they want to have what we call an enhanced incentive, um, then they have to come to the board for uh, board approval. And this process has been um, evolving or morphing over time. I think the, the I know Dr. Good was still here, so that had to be back in the 15, calendar year 15, calendar year 16 uh, time frame. And that process has morphed, and, and, the, and the, the, the process involves communications uh, from the city to us, from the developers to us, us to them, um, preparing a compensation agreement in many, many cases. Um, that process is, has now changed this year. Uh, Dr. Dixon wanted to get a member of her team involved. So Alicia Gillison will be heading up that portion of what do we get academically for these incentives that we might grant. And now that there's been a lot of moving pieces and the big concern is timing. When it started, um, there was a time when we got a call on Tuesday for something that was going to be in a press release on Thursday. And for my seven board members, that to say it didn't work would be a nice way to put it. So we worked on timing. How much time do we need to put together all the, all the discussions, to put together all the legislation, the legal documents, have the proper review and um, discussion, 
public presentations, all of that, what's that look like? So uh, we did just in the past couple of months, Eric and I sat down and came up with what he and I thought was a good representation of the steps in the process and the time that it would take to perform each step. And that's what you have before you in this colored chart. So if I can just interject just for sure. a second. Um, what you have before you um, explained wonderfully is just an open door opportunity to begin a conversation around what a timeline should look like. Um, opens us up to having a much more transparent conversation about what we want to see developed as a process and then eventually have this move forward for board approval. Mm -hmm. So um, this is just a preliminary discussion at this point. Um, we're, the, the treasurer will be accepting feedback. Dr. Roush will be look, listening for feedback as well. And we look, we're looking to carry this conversation forward uh, to next month as well. Good. And these are some of the steps that, that Eric and I have seen, that, that we have followed. Uh, if there are other things, as Mr. Cole has said, that you think ought to be interjected in there, let us know. This is good not only for us to know the process, but it will also help the city and the developers to know if you want, if you, if you, if you need to put something in the ground or start a project by this date, then you need to back up to here. I mean, that's how you do a lot of planning. This is, you know, this, this is when I want to, you know, I want to move into a new house here, but it takes this long to build it. So I got to, I got to sign the contract way back here kind of a thing. So work backwards. That's what it is. Yes. Sir, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this uh, an attempt to get something like this situated within board policy? Or, I mean, do, do, is that the ultimate goal for something like this? Well, I guess what I'm trying to, to get to, I don't want the city or developers to believe that we've got a timeline and the board is obligated to get to approval or denial based off this timeline. Is this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking something like this would be aspirational, not necessarily an obligation to the board that if we go by what you said here, by, you know, whatever week that is presented on a schedule like this, um, that I'm going to get an answer as a developer by that time. Uh, I think that gets us into some touchy situations. Okay, so thank you for that question. If I can just throw it in just for a second, because we actually talked about yep. it. <laughs> We've had this conversation. Um, from my end of it, um, and, and we're open to feedback, but my thought is, is that this is just an opportunity to take a robust look at what we would, what would be our set of expectations. Where would the board be most comfortable um, in being presented something from uh, another political subdivision like the city or some other entity that would come to us with a tax abatement proposal? Um, what is most comfortable a process for us to look at, to, de to deliberate on that, to vet it, and to have final discussion and vote for it or non-vote for it? Um, I, in some instances, have some of the same concern as you in terms of what this looks like. <clears throat> Maybe this is administrative guideline on the part of the treasurer, a type of framework by which he approaches other entities, and I'll let you elaborate. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe this is something that he approaches other entities and says, this is what we're looking at. This is what my board wants. This is our kind of process or my process that I like to go through to prepare my, my board and vet matters. Um, uh, Mr. Brown. Yeah, just a few thoughts, uh, you know, looking at this uh, at first blush. Um, my sense is that what the city would like, what developers especially would want, is some predictability, some certainty. Uh, they're not going to get certainty, but they probably like to know, you know at the beginning, how long is it going to take? 
get a decision, rather than having it completely open-ended. Um, they can often deal with something that's predictable, even if it's longer than they like, at least you know, they know where they stand. And I think that, um, in a sense, uh, the, the better we can get at saying uh, that this, you know, this is how we're going to operate and how we're going to process these, and that, you know, once, you know, assuming that they provide all the information, I mean, if it's on them, it's on them. But assuming we get everything, that we can't turn it around on this kind of a time frame and at least give you an answer one way or the other. Uh, and I, I think we should strive for that. Before I pass the ball, because I know you're bursting at the seams. Yes, sir. Um, I want you guys, if it's fair for me to say, I want you guys, because I know your, our eyes tend to look at things and it then directs our thinking at times. I want you to look at the time as somewhat arbitrary, right? This is really about process. This is really about process as much as it is about timely kind of decision making, if you will. This is really about identifying what this board is comfortable with in terms of being presented information, having the opportunity to vet that information, to make sense of it, have some administrative review of that process that then funnels, it way, funnels its way to us via this committee and vis-a-vis -a, -vis a discussion subsequent at the board table. Mr. Treasurer? So, yes. So, so then this is not a push towards a potential policy then? Is, is what is the answer is the short no, that answer? Is, Mr. That, Mr. Treasurer? Is, that is correct. Okay. All of what the three of you have said is correct. You use the word aspirational. I would, I would add the word, this is a template. Um, it is designed to give the outside folks an idea of what it takes to bring a proposal to the board. Um, the steps involved, estimated time frame. Eric and I looked at this as minimums, um, no guarantees. We have examples of one proposal that came to the board. Um, there was a lot of feedback from the table from a brand new superintendent who I think looked at them and said, seriously, 25 laptops, we got 50,000 kids and, and pushed back pretty hard on that. Um, and, and they were at this step and we pushed them back to this step and they, they started all over. So exactly what you said is something, if, if they don't provide the documents, if we don't reach that agreement up front, if, if they come and do a presentation to FAC and FAC pushes back, well, you're not coming to the next board meeting. We're not ready. But you do know that if everything worked perfectly, we could move through this. The important thing is, is this is a 15 to 16 week process. That's, that's, that's a, a fairly long time. So it's good to tell somebody who's out there. And usually the, this, the developers, by the time they get to us, it's, it's not like they just viewed the property yesterday, okay? They've been working on this for months, maybe years. And what, what I don't want us to be in, and, and I'm, I'm kind of getting the, the read of the board, we don't want to be in that situation of but for. Everything's in place but for the Board of Education. And then that sort of is a pressure point. Don't want it to be a pressure point. Don't want it to be the but for. You need to walk through this. You need to make my board comfortable with this. And this is the steps that we see at a minimum that you should, you should process through. And we're getting feedback all along the way to, to make that um, provide for you the best information we have and answer those questions all along the way. So when we do finally get down to the decision making point, um, you know, we're w well prepared. But aspirational, it's a template. Um, it's, it's a living document that, and a living process that will morph depending upon, you know, what happens um, with a developer or attorney's review or some tweak that the city wants to put in it or a special provision that the developer needs or something academically that we're not getting in our negotiations. Uh, it, it is, it's many variables, but this is just that overarching template of what that picture of the process looks like.
okay? And I had no, I, no intention, uh, really hadn't thought about whether it was policy or, or a guideline. Um, I, I thought it would be something that I could have laminated and kind of just hold up and go, you know, you got to give me at least four months here, guys. Don't, don't come in and tell me in, in May that you want something in June. It's not going to happen because of this. And, and I think, as, as, as Board Member Brown said, um, once you know, once they know it, they can work with it. You know, it's, it's um, I remember in my previous life, we used to say that the market doesn't like uncertainty. You know, if they get, if they get rumors that the tax code's going to change, they care more that they don't know what it's going to be than what it actually is. Give them a code, give them a decision, and tell them it's not going to change. Then they'll work their way around it. Give them certainty and we'll work our way around it. So this is a little bit more of, of taking some of that uncertainty out of it and just being able to say, you need four months. Work with it at a minimum. So that's what this is intended to do. And I don't know if you want to talk about the individual steps or just kind of look at it and digest it over time. Because as Board Member Cole said, we'd like to talk about it again next month. Um, before I actually say, hey, this has been vetted by FAC, um, I suppose we could talk at the board meeting if you wanted to about a timeline. But it's just something that becomes a very operational document for Eric and me when we are approached to say, okay, here's our process. You, we'll get that started. And I think it is something that once we've done some work on it, as you've discussed, we do need to sit down with the city and talk about it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's our document, our timeline, but I think it makes sense as we're trying to um, improve on the relationship that we have, that they know what we're thinking about and how we're planning to, to go about this. Okay. They may react to it. <laughs> And not sure. like it at all, of course. This isn't the kind of template that they were talking about some time back. <laughs> uh, well, and they, they, like anyone in, the, in a transaction, you want things to be known. Right. And so, yeah. yes, we did have a conversation of, could we have an agreement that was boilerplate that we could just pull off the shelf? And... Um, Sometimes I wish you could, we could videotape our, our meetings because Eric and I were like, no, that's, <laughs> that's not, that's not going to work. We're not, we're not going to have something that is a cookie cutter because when you come to us, we want to be able to vet and evaluate and consider these, these proposals, how it impacts the district. Um, you know, what is that, what is the agreement really going to look like? And each one uh, can look, look different mm -hmm. and we need the time to, to be able to, to work that out. But I think all in all, um, even though it might not be as speedy as some might like it, they will appreciate knowing that, that this, is, this is in general a time frame that we're working with. And, and that way they know when to begin those discussions. More importantly, they understand what our process is. This is an expression of our values. It really is. It's a clear expression of what the board ideally values in this process. We value the opportunity to get a thorough presentation. We value the opportunity to then take that information and digest it and work it through and make mathematical sense and other advantageous sense of this. Um, how do we then bring this to the board in a way that is comprehensive, in a way that uh, allows us to deliberate and ask questions? receive information, additional if necessary, and then move forward with a subsequent decision. So this is, is I, I love this piece because as much as it is about time and process, it's really another expression of, of what we value as a board in terms of our interactions with other municipalities. It, and uh, just a, a kind of a nuts and bolts piece of this too, by spelling out in the, in the footnote here kind of when the meetings are, you can realize if you miss an FAC meeting, that's a month delay. You miss the first board meeting of the month, it's a two-week delay. Miss the second board meeting of the month, it's a two to three-week delay. So you can get a picture of the, the critical points in this flow. And that's, I was trying to figure out how 15 weeks fit in between July 1 and, and October 1, and I think the dates just worked out kind of perfectly as to when those meetings would be. But 
Um, it all just, it just helps clarify what we're going to go through. That's, that's really the point of this. Knowing full well that you know, at a given point in time, you know, it's, it's different when you, when you begin something, um, you know, board doesn't meet in July, city council doesn't meet in August. Oh. Is that right, Eric? August. So a developer has to know we're not here, they're not here. So if you really want something, you got to hit the June you got to hit the June date, so now back up from that. If you want something from the city, you better get it done by July, otherwise August. So you see what I'm saying? Just laying that all out helps the, helps the developer know because inevitably after they do their presentation to Eric and me, um, they'll say, so um, we're thinking about approval by this and so, and Eric and I heretofore have said, yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah, you know, it's not going to happen because we need to, and, and we will then lay it out. We don't have something in writing, but we'll lay out the steps for them and drag a calendar out. This will this will help preset the stage for that. I think. You may want to add those other things to the footnote about the no meeting in July. Et sure. Cetera. Awesome. And are there any other questions, thoughts? Again, we would really love you to take this document, digest it, kind of walk through it. Um, if there's anything that you'd like to add to it, uh, we're, we're going to bring this back up again in October for a little further discussion there. Yes, yes sir. Mr. Chairman, um, I'd just like to uh, recognize the treasurer for his work on this when the board directed you to get your hands around this and sort of take ownership of the tax incentive piece, uh, you've obviously taken that to heart, and we appreciate you your work on that. It's important. Thank you. Thank you. Don't be very careful. Because Absolutely. he and I, we almost had an extra phone installed in my office for Eric. Um, A red phone. We, yeah, we, we literally live together on this. He knows a lot about the political... Uh, interactions and um, if a question comes up that I don't have an answer to he does and vice versa so I th I think we're a really good team representing the district in these transactions and um, it, it's 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 exciting and it's it's actually fun because we know that that we're negotiating the best deal we can for for the district and without getting off onto a conversation about how economic development works or should work, um, we're presented with, with a hand, a, you know, a hand of cards to play. And Eric and I figure out how best to play them for the district. And so far, I think we've been, been pretty successful. So I appreciate that, but um, Dr. Rausch and I, are, we're buddy-buddy on this one. Thank you, Dr. Rausch. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Brown. Just wonder, um, one thing that could be helpful um, and, and benefit uh, the transparency of the process is that we were able to um, put down on paper um, the various kinds of factors that we consider as we walk through this so that uh, you know, yes, we look at uh, the kinds of academics we can uh, gain. Yes, we look at whether it's a property uh, that is unlikely to be developed other than this particular project. We look at uh, the uh, the number of, of jobs, but the potential for internships, the potential for, you know, all of the various things that, you know, we, we do consider. And if we can capture that um, and, and it would demonstrate um, the values to us, why we would do something like that, uh, sure, it would have to have some sort of open-endedness, catch-all kinds of thing. but. Uh, it might be, you know, useful to try to develop that and say, you know, during this time frame, here are the kinds of things that we consider and that we look at so that uh, the community and developers and the city know 
Um, here's what we're going to be thinking about over this time frame and, and why we do this. It's interesting you bring that up, Mr. Brown. Um, we have a board policy that illuminates certain criteria as to closing for buildings. There are any number of categorical things that we take as assumption and consideration when we're talking about closing a school building. And that's the framework of the policy in, a, in and of itself. Maybe this is an opportunity to develop some sort of policy that includes these types of you know, assumptions and, and value sets moving forward. So I, 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 I like that concept. I'm, so, 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 so since we're in the discussion format a little bit here, um, I have gone, since we talked earlier, I've, I've uh, gone to look at um, policies at, at GFOA, and those policies, the ones that I've found, have generally been written with the municipality in, 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 in mind. You know, an economic development policy, not really a policy for a political subdivision that is um, not really charged with the responsibility for economic development, but is asked to approve a, one financial piece of it. Um, and as I read through them, I thought, well, I could tweak the wording of that to kind of apply to us. One of the pushbacks that I would give, though, is, is this. Somewhat to what Mr. Raglan said about the timeline. Um, I don't want to spell out too much because I don't want it to be a checklist. If A, B, C, D, E, if you get four out of five on this and three out of two, six on that one, then automatically the board, you know, this is, this is kind of, I think of a lot of instances, I, have to, I hearken back to my days when I dealt with a lot of economic things. You know, the, um, um, the Fed um, used to give an idea of what they thought would be an adequate unemployment rate and a, a rate at which they would do something. And then they realized, well, maybe, maybe we don't want to be forced into just because of unemployment falls to this level, this one metric, then we absolutely have to trigger. It's like a, a cash balance policy, and we need to work on that too. You know, does the policy say, well, when we fall below X number of days of cash, then what? If we say, well, we'll immediately institute reductions sufficient that, and then you have another metric? Do you want to tie your hands that, that way? So you, it's kind of a push me, pull you thing. Yes, give some idea of what we're looking at, but not have it be prescriptive. That's another word. You know what I mean? So that's, that'll, that'll take some time. I, I agree with that because with my experience in these types of deals, they're all different. Mm -hmm. And the moment you put something on paper that standardizes either a process or expectations of the district, uh, the developer is going to want that. And the deal could be different. The needs of the district change. And so whatever we put on paper uh, at, a, at any given time that a developer may come to us, we may need more of one thing or the other. And the more you leave it open to allow for our people to negotiate, you know, in the moment uh, to get the best you know, needs for our students, um, the less restrictive it is on us. My concern on the timeline is that, you know, we get to week 16 and it's not ready, but the developer has already made provisions for themselves. And they say, it's week 16, give me an up or down. I don't want the board tied into that. But to the point of, of mm -hmm. these types of things, the, the goodies uh, that would be coming to the students of this district because of um, whatever we get out of these types of deals, I think it's on a deal per deal basis and, and you know, I don't want to tie our staff down into saying, well, hey, we can only ask for this amount right here because, you know, not a policy or maybe it wouldn't be a policy, but something that we have on paper implies that, you know, this is enough and, uh, and the b developer comes into that and that makes it, that makes it easy. We start here and, and that's it, but that might not be what we need as a district at that particular moment. So. Yeah. Um, it makes more sense because most developers know that you know things are going to change and they're going to need different things as things go along. So you don't have to have a the timeline shouldn't be set, like, but it's, it's an open-ended and it's just a guideline. 
have things have things should work and if things come in, information is gathered, the process moves along. But there should be um, some sort of when things are expected to be done and based upon the developer's experience, they, they are they should I would assume they are understanding how this, this process works because most of them probably have gone through it before, maybe, I would assume, or they have an idea of how the process should work. And part of it, too, is on the front end, uh, because we'll get a, we'll have a verbal conversation, and they'll go, okay, we're ready to go, and I'll go, stop. Paperwork, I need to see legislation. You haven't given anything to our attorneys. So part of this is also to say, you've got this, I think we put down by like eight week process where you need to talk to us, you need to, to negotiate that compensation part, you need to figure out the paperwork, get that all ready to go because we can't come to FAC, we can't come to the board until the, all of that review is done. So, so, so part of saying, if you wanna be here, you've gotta have this done, helps light the fire on the front end too. Um, so I, I and, and rest assured, Eric and I have over time have laid the groundwork for a little bit of what you're talking about in terms of um, essentially it can be cash. We all like cash. Um, or it, 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 we like to have some sort of educational programming and then we do a for instance. Let you, so I think we have um, a couple of agreements in place that look very different. Some of them are e equipment, supplies, kinds of things. Other is more um, class, like class uh, tutorial types of things, um, workplace seminar type activities for students. So you know, we can we can certainly give a list of examples, but we want that blank page there so that the academic team based upon not only what the develop we had a developer come in and says I'm not from here I'm not going to be here I want to build a building up and how much money do you want I'll, I'll, I just want to do this as a cash deal and so we go okay great <laughs> there's a price for that <laughs> and but others come in and say look we're already doing something with the district we've always partnered with we would like to expand that partnership and have that part of, be part of the consideration in this in this package so uh, examples yes a for instance list yes um, but I think we should be uh, free to be somewhat open-ended as you all are I think I'm hearing from all of you and, and if I may ooh, I'm very loud. Uh, part of it depends upon who's coming to the table and what, what they can offer. I mean, it, if, if their background is in construction, they're gonna certainly be able to offer one set of skills or one set of items uh, versus if you're a healthcare company or if you're uh, a culinary arts company or if you're, you know, it's gonna really depend upon, you know, either who the developer is, if it's just a straight spec building, as, uh, as Stan said, we'll give you cash. Uh, and sometimes it's, they have a deeper root, they have deeper roots in the community and, and entity they're building for, the entity that's coming to ask for um, the enhanced incentive, they've got expertise in a certain area that aligns with uh, various programs that we may have, uh, you know, in our STEM fields, in our career tech areas, et cetera. So I think, I think knowing that as well, I think using that as a leverage point is important too. agree with all that and I wasn't suggesting um, that you know we need to write it in a in a way that uh, hinders us uh, but it also um, you know I, I just wanted to have some conversation about it uh, but another way to think about it is uh, and I, I said this uh, with the community, with our taxpayers. Uh, we've got to do better than we have in the past about explaining uh, why these sometimes are good things for us to do. And I'm wondering if, you know, we show the community, here's the kinds of things that we look at. Here's the things we, we talk about and we inquire about and we try to uh, gain through this process 
that might serve us on, on that side of things as well. Mm. And again, just ideas, just you know, for conversation, and if it doesn't go anywhere, that's fine too. Thank you. So um, this has been a wonderful discussion so far. Again, we just want folks to take this back, rummage through it, feel, you know, feel, feel free to send any comments to uh, Treasurer Bohork and feel free to see, see me on that as well. And also Dr. Rausch uh, moving forward. And we're gonna come back again in uh, the second week of October and have another conversation around the dialogue around this where the table's a little more filled up. <clears throat> so is there, uh, does that conclude? That concludes the, uh, the entire agenda. Awesome. So and unfortunately, there. you don't have a quorum. I don't know how you adjourn without a quorum, <laughs> other than perhaps you just gavel us off into the sunset. I don't know. But walk away. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, we'll just say that the meeting did officially end at what time? This is 5.07, I have. 5.07 and two-tenths of a tick-tock. We'll walk out. All right. Thank, Thank you, all you. gentlemen.